Um, so thanks to Ted for um, inviting me to come here tonight and to Lorcan, as always. Um, and also thanks for making it through the snow. Um, so anyway, what I thought I would do is just like read the first page of the book, um, just to give you like an introduction to me and how I came to write this book about St. Mark's Place. So I grew up in Manhattan's East Village. My parents have lived in their three-bedroom, top-floor walk-up on St. Mark's Place since 1973. I was born in 1976, an only child. As a little girl in the 80s, I navigated sidewalks cluttered with crack vials, used condoms, and junkies on the nod. I witnessed the Tompkins Square Park riots from my window. As a teenager in the 90s, I bought egg creams at the old-time newspaper shop Gem Spa and hair dye from the punk shop Manic Panic. I rented movies at Kim's Video and worked the register at St. Mark's Comics. You grew up on St. Mark's Place? People sometimes ask as if they didn't know that children could. <laughs> or you grew up on St. Mark's Place? Implying that I seem too normal to hail from a place with so many mohawks and tattoo parlors. And then invariably these strangers will pity me for having missed the street's golden era, which they will variously identify as the 1950s, 1960s, or 1970s. And they're right, I missed a lot. I did not love in or be in or do anything in. I never sat on a trash can outside the Five Spot Jazz Club listening to Thelonious Monk. I did not see Andy Warhol introduce the Velvet Underground at the Mod Dom. I did not hang with the Ramones or the New York Dolls. Nor did I see W.H. Auden promenade to church wearing his slippers. Much less Peter Stuyvesant stumping down the same lane on his silver and wooden head leg. I am, however, as familiar as a deacon's daughter with the religion of St. Mark's Place. The street has provided generation after generation, this is slide showing, um, with a mysterious flash of belonging. Having interviewed more than 200 current and former residents, I marvel at how many of them describe experiences of mortal peril, dissipation, and misadventure, and then conclude by saying their era on St. Mark's in 1964 or 1977 or 2012 was the best time of their lives. Um, so I wrote an op-ed about a month ago for the New York Times, um, and it was about this feeling that we have about cities, and about cities leaving us. Um, so I have a complicated feeling about that, um, that spirit, but one piece of information I got from doing so many interviews, and I, I talked to some of you out here, um, I did about 200, 250 interviews um, with people from the neighborhood. Um, and in the course of that, I would ask them, when did the street die? Because they sort of, most people said, you say Mark's place is over. East Village is over. New York City is over. And I would say, like, when did it die? And they would say, well, obviously, 1988, right? Like, when the gap opened. <laughs> obviously, 1989, when Billy Joel, like, desecrated it with his Matter of Trust video. <laughs> obviously. And they would all have these, like, obviously. <laughs> and, um, so I started to say, well, what was the best year? Like, when was the street itself? When was it like magic? And then they would say, um, 1964, obviously, or 1977, obviously. Um, and then I, I did some math finally, and I realized that the moment people said that the street was the best, that it was never better, um, was when they themselves were at their personal hottest. <laughs> the city is amazing when you're 19. <laughs> my personal philosophy, the street's still pretty great for 19-year-olds. You go out there after the show and, you know, it's like pretty nice for them. Um, so anyway, uh, I just want to say too, there's this spirit. So this book is called St. Marks is Dead because, you know, that's what people kept telling me. Um, and there's something sort of about the neighborhood that really lends itself to that spirit, that spirit of like, it was better before. Um, so, you know, there goes the neighborhood has been heard on the street in many tongues since the Lenape. <laughs> Someone is probably saying it right now. A college student told me that St. Mark's Place died just a couple of years ago. With the closing, anybody guess? Uh, the close, close, Cooper Union Starbucks. <laughs> right. As students, James Estrada and his friends lounged there all day free of hassle. I came back from break, says Estrada, and it was gone. We used to hang out there and feel glamorous and drink strawberry champagne. There's no room for life to be lived there now. 
<laughs> so the moral that I draw from this is that the gentrified are gentrifiers who have stuck around. Um, okay, so first I think we should do a rest in peace for the Cooper Union Starbucks. <laughs> um, there are only like three more within two blocks, so I think we're really doing that. Um, okay, so what I thought I would do, um, unless anybody has any other suggestions, is just do a quick history of the street. Um, I thought I'd go Just through, you know, light. like... Should we dim the lights? The light? Oh, Tony. Okay. Oh, Tony. Okay. Oh, Tony. So, here, the Lenape. <laughs> Alright, so, um, the only people who have any real grounds for complaint. <laughs> <laughs> you hear people in the 70s saying, like, there was nothing here when we got here. There was some stuff. <laughs> Alright, so at this point, no, not really. So, um... So anyway, right, you know, right around where that smoke is is where we are now, um, and it was a, a hunting ground. So right now where we, we are, there were um, there were deer and rabbits and blue jays and turtles, um, and then the Dutch came along and ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is across the street from where we are right now. Um, this is basically Eighth Street between First and Second. This is a descendant of Peter Stuyvesant. Um, it's pretty, right? Um, well, they wouldn't think so, but, um, but the Stuyvesants did. And the Stuyvesants um, really made the area very lovely and um, bucolic. And the idea was that this was going to be a neighborhood that was a respite from the, the, the tip of the island, which was full of like, prostitutes and pirates, so, which is kind of ironic because, of course, the East Village then became all prostitutes and pirates. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, so I skipped some stuff. Uh, but basically what happened is, you know, so it was the countryside, and it was a beautiful countryside. And then these state lawmakers came in and put in the grid in 1811. At that point, people said, New York is over. <laughs> you know, this grid has destroyed everything beautiful about the city. Um, it's just for commerce now. Um, you know, the capitals have won. So, um, so then, you know, one of the things, the next kind of phase in the East Village's history is you start getting all these do-gooders showing up, um, and all these immigrants. And Peter Cooper built this school um, at the, the end of you know, what was not really yet called St. Mark's Place. Um, and you know, it was this real magnet for poor people, which made people say that Peter Cooper had destroyed uh, the neighborhood. Um, they said that the market stalls were actually you know, just so he didn't have to pay taxes. Um, and then, you know, it became a big union headquarters. So you see the addresses in, like, the union fit books, and, like, almost all of them um, at one point are St. Mark's Place addresses. Um, so this, right now, is Arlington Hall, which is 19 to 21 St. Mark's Place between 2nd and 3rd Avenue, and um, that's where the Chipotle is right now. <laughs> um, so it was a big hangout, you know, as it still is, for young people kind of looking to get into trouble. <laughs> they were slightly better dressed. <laughs> but, you know, here's some riots from 1874, and they look kind of an awful lot like the riots a hundred and some odd years later. Um, but in this case, actually, a lot of the riots were about the city not fixing up the neighborhood. Um, so it's kind of ironic, I think, that like these these riots back here were because they wanted they wanted um, shiny buildings and they wanted you know parks um, cleaned and fixed up and made nice and all the riffraff kicked out. Um, and that wasn't happening fast enough, so they had a riot here, and then sometime later, they had a riot for the office reason. Um, so one thing that changed the neighborhood quite a bit was the General Slocum disaster. Um, do people know the General Slocum disaster? Yes. Okay, you're like a much more educated crowd. <laughs> um, I did before I started doing this research. And, um, <laughs> yeah, well. Um, so it was 1904, um, for those of you who don't know. This is a picture that I found in a book about the disaster from that year. Um, and there were a lot of these books where they printed pictures of the people who'd been lost. So it was more than a thousand women and children. Um, and it was the, it's still the second biggest um, disaster in New York City's history after September 11th. Um, so, okay, so the Germans were devastated by the Slocum disaster. They were already kind of moving out. Um, and then they just sort of like, the ones who were left are just like, this is it. Um, and they leave, leaving the neighborhood pretty wide open for, um, yeah, some other immigrants and some gangsters. This is Dopey Benny Fine, who's a Jewish gangster. Um, and he was called Dopey Benny because of his sleepy eyes. 
Um, and he was like fairly moral because he mostly only beat up like scabs and union bosses. So that was kind of set him apart from his other um, gangster friends. And he was he hung out on St. Mark's place a lot. So here's where we are right now. This is Shive's place, which is what Theater 80 was um, back in the day. So. It's the show place of the East Side. So. <laughs> the show place of the East Side. Yeah. So um, and then this is a guy who was hanging out on St. Mark's place, also in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and his name is Mr. Zero. So he's the one like gesturing like this. Um, and he started all of these homeless shelters along St. Mark's Place. Um, and he was a real showman. So what he was doing here was saying, like, you know, here's this veteran of the First World War, and he can't find work. You know, who will bid on him? He staged these like slave auctions, basically, um, to sort of call attention to the plight of these returning veterans who couldn't find work. Um, and he started something called the Tub between Second and Third Avenue. Um, and he called it the Tub because he said it was for people who were completely naked of money. Um, anyway, so he had, a, he had a kind of empire here of do-gooding. Um, and then he left when the new deal came in because he said the government was doing his work for him. And he left his landlord in uh, the equivalent of about a million dollars in debt today. And he lived on the island for the rest of his life with his like vixen Shakespearean actress wife. Okay. Well played. Um, all right, so this is actually a block over. Um, and this is in the 19, um, I guess it's, the early 1940s, and it's the, the Polish students in the neighborhood reading about World War II. Um, so in that period of time, it was very much a poor immigrant neighborhood. Um, and I talked to people who grew up here in the 1940s, and they talk about it as maybe not the most luxurious part of town. Um, one person told me that he used to pick his route home from school based on whether he wanted to be beaten up by Italians um, or <laughs> Polish boys that day. Um, and the neighborhood changed again in a very big way when the 3rd Avenue L train came down um, in the mid-50s. Um, so this is, the, this is the big parade that they had to celebrate the fall of the 3rd Avenue L. So this is where the St. Mark's Hotel is now. It was the Sagamore Cafeteria, which I think Kerouac called the Respectable Bums Cafeteria. <laughs> um, so what happened though when that L train came down is that all of the Bohemians and artists in the West Village just flooded east. Now it wasn't, there wasn't this barrier there, and it didn't seem quite, um, quite as other. And so they just kind of like extended Bohemia into the East Village um, and started calling it the East Village um, right around that time. You know, it was in, coined by landlords, um, as many neighborhood names are. Um, but, you know, a lot of people I know still call it the Lower East Side. Okay, so then, you know, here's some <laughs> Uh, and it was still Jump Spa, right? Jump Spa, holding it down for the East Village. Hasn't changed at all. And we still get an egg cream. People would tell me, like, um, oh, you can't, um, ever, you'll never get the secret out of them for how you make an egg cream, right? So I went up to them and I said, how do you make an egg cream? And they said, uh, it's seltzer and milk and you bet chocolate syrup. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's a picture Alan Ginsberg took of Jack Kerouac um, on Avenue A, right below St. Mark's Place. And here's Leroy Jones right around the corner, um, also, um, like on St. Mark's, you know, right above on 2nd Avenue, the Playhouse there. That was the debut of his uh, play, The Slave. You can just hang out in the bathroom. Um, and then um, here's Slimius Monk getting into um, the patroness Nika's Bentley in front of the Five Spot Jazz Club in 64. Um, Cooper Union's right behind there. Um, W.H. Auden at the hardware store. Um, so some of the best stories I've heard were about W.H. Auden. And um, he was just like this very magical, saint-like figure in the neighborhood. Um, and the only people that he seemed to make really upset were the priests at St. Mark's Church. Um, and that's because he thought they weren't religious enough and the case could be made. Um, but basically he would complain if they changed anything, like the linens on the altar at St. Mark's Church. Um, and he wrote a letter to Father Michael Allen, who was a very radical hippie priest there at St. Mark's Church. And the, the, it was about like the liturgy or something. Um, but it begins, Dear Father Michael Allen, have you gone stark raving mad? <laughs> and it continues, continues, and then the last line is, I implore you by the bowels of Christ. <laughs> so, and you'll see here, 
here that he's wearing these slippers, these like British slippers, and he wore them everywhere. Every story any neighbor told me about Building H. Odd, they're like, and you know, he used to wear his slippers everywhere. <laughs> there he is at the hardware store. Okay, so next big change, right? The Arlington Hall, before it became the Chipotle, it was the Dom and the Electric Circus. Yeah. Oh, yes, recognition. <laughs> Who here had, was at the Dom or the Electric Circus? Ooh, pretty good. Wow, okay, cool. Um, all right, so here is uh, a picture from when it was, when more, it was pretty brief. I mean, one thing that's kind of funny that I, I had this idea that like, when I, because I used to hear about the Electric Circus, it was like 30 years. Right, it was like open forever. Um, it was like two, right? It was like two or three. Um, and you know, Andy Warhol, like he had this exploding plastic inhabitable, like twice, like you know, not that many times, um, upstairs. And this is one of the one of the times. So, and then also something I didn't know until I started working on the book was that this building became very segregated. So downstairs it became a black nightclub, and upstairs it was the electric circus with all the celebrities. Um, so this is from the Dom downstairs. Um, and the, the groups, it doesn't seem like, mixed a whole lot. Um, but they both were really thriving um, for a couple of years. Here's another shot. The Dom. All right, so then uh, <laughs> things get a little crazy. This is Jerry Rubin holding his plastic gun. Um, and you know he apparently ran around with this gun a lot, and um, so I got I got all the pictures from this roll of film, and like in not a single one of them is anybody paying attention to the fact that there's like a shot. Of film. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there'd be like one kid like pointing or somebody being like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is like so that he's you know started the Yippies um, with Abby Hoffman on St. Mark's Place, number thirty. Um, this is Joey Skaggs, who is also a um, a kind of a, a like funny activist. Um, this is he did a lot of really kind of clever things, um, and you know these groups they would do things like plant a tree in the middle of St. Mark's Place. Um, and then one other thing Joey Skaggs did was he arranged something called um, he called the hippie bus tour to Queens. <laughs> and the idea was that there were all these people who were coming to gawk at the hippies. They would bring like tour buses, the way they you know you have those red tour buses now, but they um, they would come and they would like look for hippies and then they would say, there's one, like if they saw somebody there. <laughs> um, and so he decided he was tired of this and what he did was he got a Greyhound bus, he pulled up in front of Gem Spa, he filled it with hippies, they drove to Queens, <laughs> they went to like White Castle and Dairy Queen, and then they like went and took pictures of people mowing their lawns. <laughs> And they came up to them and they said, tell us about your lifestyle. <laughs> and they're confused old women in Queens saying, like, I don't know, we go to bed early. <laughs> okay, so then another big change. Um, this is uh, Groovy. So Groovy was sort of a um, guide for uh, runaways. He, he helped runaways, basically. Um, and was, seems like, pretty universally adored by that whole crowd. Um, and he was brutally murdered along with his kind of girlfriend, um, runaway he was helping, Linda Fitzpatrick, um, in what was called the Groovy Murders. And that was in 1967, and at that point, a lot of parents who let their kids go to the East Village started to think, that might not be such a good idea. Um, and so the neighborhood kind of became more of a playground, not for these teenagers exploring their you know, freedom, um, but for sort of a much seedier, uh, more dangerous group of people. Like punks. Um, so, you know, this is right across the street. This is the band television. It's a photograph by David Gallas, who still lives on the next block. Um, and, you know, so the punks really took over from the hippies. Um, and again, there was this, this, this replacement factor. So, you know, the punks and the hippies didn't get along great, just like the hippies and the beatniks hadn't gotten along great, just like the beatniks and the, um, the immigrants hadn't gotten along great. Um, one story I didn't mention is, this, you know, the, the, do you remember Leshko's? Yes. Okay, so, um, so, you know, they served the hippies and the punks and many of us too. Um, and, you know, their family still lives over between first and second, or actually, what, on this block. Um, but anyway, so Stefania Leshko, um, she was working one day and came home laughing, and her son said, why are you laughing? And she said, 
because there were these hippies at the counter, and one of them turned to the other and said, you know, after the revolution, this will all be free. <laughs> um, and so that was sort of like, and she was like, yeah, I'm gonna come cook for you, for nothing. <laughs> and also, you know, they had fled, they had fled um, the Ukraine. So it's like this whole, this whole kind of countercultural thing of like really loving this idea of free love and communism. Um, didn't, didn't fly well with the Ukrainians, right? Um, so anyway, and then here come the punks, and what's kind of funny is when they come in, it almost like united the Ukrainians and the hippies. It's like, okay, they are really bad. So here they are. Um, you know, these guys, right? <laughs> so here's the New York Dolls, um, who of course had some of the best East Village songs. Um, you know, and one um, story I tell in the book is about a woman named Carol Rosenthal who lived on St. Mark's Place and 2nd Avenue, and she was a teacher, and she had this great student, and one day she saw him on St. Mark's Place, and he was wearing, um, you know, he was dressed like this. And she was like, oh, it's so embarrassing, I'm going to pretend I don't see him. Um, and then it turned out, later she learned about the dolls, and he was one of them. He was um, Arthur Killer Kane. And then she was very proud. <laughs> so, and then here's Titian Snooky, who started Manic Panic between 2nd and 3rd Avenue on St. Mark's Place. Um, and, uh, and they, you know, they always wanted to be on St. Mark's Place. They told me it was like, they thought they really made it. This was like, you know, and you think about St. Mark's Place in 1977, and you think, well, you know, not maybe the most glamorous place in the entire world, but for them it really was. Um, and Trash and Bogville, of course, another one. Um, something else that was on the street at the time, St. Mark's Baths. Um, people told me a lot of stories that um, I should, probably shouldn't repeat. <laughs> company about St. Mark's Baths. Uh, but, you know, of course it was shut down um, because of the AIDS crisis. Um, this is me and my mom when I was a baby. Um, right around that time. So I was born in 76. And, um, and again, like you see... You see Titian Snooky showing up and being like, this is amazing, it's so great. Um, when you see the pictures, it's just like, it was such a dive, right? And my parents, too, I dedicate the book to them, and they say, like, only they would look at this kind of crumbling infrastructure and, you know, like, trash all over the streets and all this and be like, this is a great place to raise it. <laughs> so right downstairs from where I grew up was, um, uh, it was Club 57. So I don't know if people... You're more, of a, you're more of an electric circus crowd. There, um, <laughs> there, was, there wasn't the like, oh, yay. Um, so, you know, Keith Haring and Ann Magnuson and all these people um, had sort of a version of the Warhol, you know, exploding plastic inevitable because they showed up later and they'd, they'd heard about it and how great it was and it wasn't there anymore because that happens a lot, right? You show up and the party's over. So they made their own party. It was a version of it and they would do things like monster movie nights or um, Lady Wrestling, which is this. <coughs> She's okay. <laughs> um, so there's Madonna, um, also on this block, um, I guess across the street. Um, and yeah, people, it's funny, not a lot of really favorable stories did I hear about Madonna. <laughs> um, like a lot of the, the guys from Koi Bar really talked a lot of trash about her. Um, so here's the Beastie Boys. Um, right across the street, Stromboli, which is still there. Again, Gem Spot's still there, Stromboli's still there, lots of stuff. It's still here. Um, and this was sort of a new, you know, new period. And then, you know, we had the riots. So I remember watching them out my window. Um, you know, pretty, pretty intense and violent. And then they kind of lost um, because, well, actually this is a little bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You know who that is. All right, yeah. so, so this is around the same time. This is the case for why it was good, right, that the park got cleaned out. This is uh, Dana Rockwitz, the butcher of Compass Square Park, um, who kills his girlfriend and cooked her into stew. And fed her to the homeless. And fed her to the homeless. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so, okay, so then the riots happen. No more murders. No more murders. Um, anyway, and then, um, you know, you have this kind of flowering. I mean, what I call it is like the flowering of like the beta species, right? Once the anarchists had basically been wiped out of that part of town, um, suddenly, this is when I was a teenager, you had drag queens. Um, and you had, well, the gap. Um, you had like nerds hanging out at Kim's video, right? Like, and you had 
skaters. This is Harold Hunter, who I don't know if you recognize. He was up and down the street pretty much constantly um, when I was growing up, and he became this internationally famous, um, famous star, and he came out of the projects um, east of the park. Then you had Coney Island High, um, which is a rock club. Um, and it was in the former McGregor's bar. I don't know if people remember Paul McGregor's um, hairstyling, and he invented the, the shag. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, um, and then it became you know, a bar, and then it became boy bar, and then it became Coney Island High. And now, of course, the street is largely Japanese and Korean. Um, there are a lot of Japanese Korean teenagers hang out here. Um, and it's, you know, you go there at 2 in the morning, it's pretty lively. There's still a lot going on. This is Kenko, where people wait like two hours for a table at Kenko um, and search and destroy upstairs. Um, and, you know, that kind of brings us to now. And what I see really is just there's a lot, there's still a lot going on from what I can tell. Um, you know, there's still shows here. There's still shows at Under St. Mark's. Um, tons of shows at Joe's Pub that are really exciting. Um, and I really still, I still see young people having this same magical, you know, flash of belonging. Um, so that's the end of my history, and then I would love if anybody wants to ask questions or talk, we could do that too. Um, Still live here? Oh, we're going to questions right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm done. So that's the end of the. End of the